Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotch Tank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion on American Phoenix, Heroes of the Pentagon on 9-11. Journalist Phil Hirschkorn and author Lincoln M. Starnes will be joined by Benjamin W. Starnes, Lieutenant Colonel Marilyn Wills, Army Sergeant First Class Christopher Brayman, and Army Sergeant Major Tony Rose, all of whom were in the Pentagon on 9-11 and performed acts of rescue. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs you can view on our YouTube channel. On Friday, September 10th, we'll present the discussion on a life of selfless service, sacrifice, and civic engagement, honoring the life of Cyril Rick Rescola. Although Rescola perished in the attack on the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001, he is credited with saving the lives of 2,700 fellow employees of Morgan Stanley and inspiring all those around him. On Tuesday, September 14th at noon, we welcome back David M. Rubenstein to discuss his latest book, The American Experiment, Dialogues on a Dream. Through interviews with some of our nation's greatest minds, Pulitzer Prize-winning historians, diplomats, music legends, and sports giants, the book looks into the inspiring story of America as a grand experiment in democracy, culture, innovation, and ideals. Twenty years ago, on a bright blue sky Tuesday morning, the world was rocked by the incredible news of the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Here in Washington, people streamed out of their buildings, stunned to see clouds of smoke rising above the Pentagon just across the Potomac River. Our guests for tonight's discussion were eyewitnesses to the September 11th attack on the Pentagon and contributed to the rescue of survivors. Their stories are included in Lincoln Starn's book, American Phoenix, which is an account of the attack on the Pentagon told from the perspective of those who were there. The National Archives presents this 9-11 commemorative programming in conjunction with an exhibit of children's letters to victims, first responders, and recovery workers from the Red Cross 9-11 Recovery Program collection. The exhibit is on display in the rotunda of the National Archives through October 6th and is online at archives.gov as well. Our moderator, Phil Hirschkorn, spent 25 years reporting and producing stories for national news networks, CNN, CBS, PBS, and Fox. Hirschkorn led one of the first CNN field crews dispatched to the World Trade Center on 9-11 and appeared in the CNN documentary, America Remembers. He extensively covered the investigation of the attacks, including the work of the 9-11 Commission and the rebuilding of the Trade Center site. Now let's hear from our panel. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, David, for that uh, introduction. Uh, let me go around the horn and, and just by name, uh, remind everyone who's with us. We have uh, five guests joining us, including the author of the book, uh, Lincoln Starnes, and uh, four other people who are at the Pentagon on 9-11. Um, if you haven't figured it out by now, Ben Starnes uh, is a relative. It's Lincoln's brother. We also have uh, with us uh, Tony Rose and uh, Christopher Brennan and Marilyn Wills. And you can see them all on the screen. This is a pandemic world, so we're probably all used to this array of, of live events, um, though it is, of course, second choice uh, to all being in the same room with a live audience that we can hear breathing and, 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 and um, interact with, but we will make do as we all have for uh, 18 months. I want to thank the National Archives for asking me um, to do this. Um, recently, I just, uh, with my uh, producing partner, Allison Gilbert, we just put together our own film called Reporting 9-11 and Why It Still Matters. And that's sort of a theme for tonight, right? Why It Still Matters. Our film, which is also streaming uh, with our producing partner, Wondrium, is a journalistic take, uh, an oral history of the day that covers all three sites, including the Pentagon, including some people I may quote from tonight as I ask my questions. Uh, but the focus tonight, as uh, you heard, is this book, American Phoenix, uh, Lincoln's book. And let me take a moment before we get to the other four guests and uh, bring in Lincoln to talk about why you wrote this book. This was the first book you wrote. and and 
really your day job is is something not as a historian down there in Georgia. Um, Lincoln, what was your motivation to put together this book, this sort of riveting oral history uh, told through these participants and others uh, in the book? Well, the motivation of the people right here, um, and I'm honored to be with them. I feel like I know them, like they're members of my family or something, because, you know, I, I wrote, when I wrote that book, <clears throat> I put myself in, in there with them, and I tried to I tried to experience what they experienced, and it's an honor to be with them, first of all. But when you ask me as far as what a motivation was, uh, the genesis for the book was a conversation I had with my brother in 2002, and he had been there that day, and he wanted to uh, record uh, his memoirs and those of his colleagues, Jim Goff and Ed Lucci. And uh, so they were the first three people interviewed. And uh, then I realized I didn't have enough material for a book. So I just decided to write a book on my own. And I'd never had any training in investigative journalism or anything like that of that sort. And I just began interviewing people, just cold calling. And by the way, just full disclosure, what's your day job down there in Georgia? Not a historian? I'm a FedEx courier. I deliver packages all day long. Pick them up and deliver. Well, w- welcome to the world of citizen journalism. Uh, let me take a moment and just briefly, um, and I should do ladies first, but since you mentioned your brother first, let's get that out of the way and then we'll go to Marilyn. I'd like each panelist to just take a minute or two so everyone gets to know you a little bit because uh, it's going to be a long hour with a lot of different people talking. So just for our early traction, Ben, starting with you, what was your job on 9-11? What was your plan for the day, say before, you know, 846 or 937 when planes hit buildings? And what was it about your military career, because you were all in the military, up to that point that in a sense prepared you for what was about to happen? And let's Phil. start with you. Thank you, Phil. Um, I was a vascular surgery fellow. So I had already completed a general surgery residency in the Army at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and was doing my fellowship. I had already done a utilization tour in Germany for two years. I had been deployed to the war in Kosovo, so I had one combat deployment already. And as a former military surgeon, I, uh, I've i seen some pretty horrific stuff. Um, uh, I was What was I doing that day? I was seeing vascular surgery clinic. We had a very busy clinic that day. And uh, I had just seen a post-op carotid patient. And when I heard that a plane had hit the tower, I told my intern, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have time for current events. I want you to pick up a chart, go see a patient. Mm -hmm. And after the second tower was hit, then we knew something was going down. So, uh, and and then the day changed permanently. And just so people get their bearings, Walter Reed is not close to the Pentagon, but it's not that far either. How many miles and how did you end up getting there when the decision was made that folks like you could be of use uh, at that site? So, so, so the old Walter Reed Army Medical Center was only seven miles from the Pentagon, just north in the north part of D.C. Now it's in Bethesda. It's been moved over to Bethesda. But um, I got a call from Jim Goff, who was the assistant chief of surgery he knew that I had experienced triage and casualties. And he told me, Ben, a plane has just hit the Pentagon. I need you to go lead a surgical team to the site and to triage patients there. I went down to the emergency room and got on a bus. Uh, The commanding general, Michael Dunn, and a chaplain came on board the bus. They said a prayer for us. And uh, then we had a police escort that headed off into the city. Um, and, and, you know, we went out into the city and the city was in chaos. Every siren in Washington, DC was going off. Um, every single siren, um, people were in gridlock in the streets. Uh, the, the, the cars were just stacked in front of us. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was a troubling sight because you saw people that had, briefcases and were dressed like businessmen or businesswomen. And they were sitting on the sidewalks weeping because their world had just been disrupted. They, we all knew that we were under attack and uh, there was nowhere to go. It was gridlock. Um, 
and then I can go into the next events of what we did to get through the city if you want, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. Sure, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, Marilyn, Tony, and Chris, of course, you were all in the building um, uh, working at 846 when Tower 1 was hit in New York and, and uh, at 903 when Tower 2 was hit, and you were still in the building, in a sense, going about your business, but probably clearly distracted. Marilyn, remind us, what was your job that day? What were you doing? And, and what about your career prepared you for what was about to happen? Oh, well, great question. So uh, my job, I was the Congressional Affairs Officer for the G1, which is the person, the Senior Personnel Chief, Lieutenant General Maude. And we'll talk about him a bit later. Um, what was I doing that day? I will tell you that initially I got up, as I always do, it was beautiful. But for some reason that morning, I my family didn't pray. So I just kissed my girls on the cheek and I kissed my husband and I took off because I knew I had a meeting to attend at the Pentagon at nine o'clock. Um, so that's what I was doing that day. And how did the military prepare me? I was a military police officer for over 30 years. Um, and that's until I retired. But as you know, in the military, we changed jobs several times. But being a military police officer, it will prepare you for the things that are unknown. And I will tell you one more thing I want to add. When I was in college, I had a professor tell me once, and I never forgot it. He said, always know your exit before you enter a building. And so for strange reasons, I would go into the Pentagon different ways so I would know how to get out of that building, not knowing that that would help me on September 11th. Thank you, Marilyn. Tony, same questions, please. Um, I picked up my Three Stooges bud, got my cup of coffee. Operations NCO and I were talking about getting a conference ready for our counselors worldwide. I was a senior sergeant major in the G1 for retention program, not too far from Colonel uh, Wells. And uh, uh, we got called to come down to the general's office, take a look at the phone, General Axum. Uh, we got there and they were watching the reruns of what was going on in New York on TV. Uh, we went back to our desk only about 20 feet away. I told my ops NCO, we need to change our plans for today. We need to be careful. And before careful could get out of my mouth, the building shook as if though it were in the center of an earthquake. Uncle Sam and the Three Stooges went one way and I went flying into a wall another way. And the whole day changed. Thank you, Tony. And Chris, just to get things started, where were you uh, when the plane hit, uh, Tony just alluded to, uh, what was your job and what were you planning for the day? And how, what about your military background prepared you for what was about to transpire? Well, I was, uh, I was the aide to the general of the army for the chief of staff of the army. Um, I was a, also a procurement agent for them. I, I actually, my duty before being stationed at the Pentagon was I was in the Ranger Regiment, 2nd of the 75th as an airborne ranger. Uh, and so we had many different hats that we had, you know, had learned throughout, uh, my military career. And one of them was seesaw combat search and rescue. So, you know, being stationed at the Pentagon was completely out of my skill set. Uh, and when I got stationed there, it's funny that, uh, bef they didn't know what to do with me. It was just really funny because the generals were having me sit down and, Hey, Sergeant Brayman, uh, what about this, uh, this particular equipment or what about this um, particular uh, uniform or, you know, does it work or all that stuff because of being a combat soldier, my entire military career, I had no idea uh, that, you know, that type of job existed working at the Pentagon, uh, working for the, the four-star general. And, uh, you know, I have many multiple hats. I also have, uh, I'm also a certified sous chef. So I tell everybody I'm an airborne ranger cook. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's kind of funny to me, but, you know. Now, Lincoln, I, I hope you and I uh, in the archives don't get in trouble. It seems to have an Army-heavy panel here. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, Air Force, Marines, uh, Navy, all have personnel in the Pentagon. From the work you did putting this book together, what can you say in terms of the size of the Pentagon, how many people work there, um, what they do um, when we're not at war. Um, 
Uh, give us a sense of what you learned and put in the book in terms of that kind of background, Lincoln. Well, it was originally, the building was originally envisioned by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and, uh, and General Brown Somerville. Um, and the problem they had was they needed to consolidate all of the different branches of the military into one, you know, one building because this was on the eve of World War II. And uh, so we're, we're right just after we got into it. And so they needed to be able to consolidate all those branches because they were spread out all over Washington, D.C. So if you wanted to go to the Army, you had to go to one building, the Navy, another building uh, where the Marine Corps would have been. That would have been the only place because the Marine Corps is a subset of the Navy or under the aegis of the Navy. Um, and so that was really the primary reason why they built it where they did. But, you know, having a building that big and a distinctive five-sided building uh, presented a very large target for the enemy. And where it sits, I mean, it's just right right out there in the open, you know. So as far as being clandestine, it wasn't very good to us. Right, but, it's like uh, a big, it's also like a big or was a big sort of concrete block, right? Because of the steel shortage during the war. Well, they had to, they needed the steel for ships. So they were they 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 created ramps inside the building, so you could walk from one floor down to the other on ramps. You know they 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 increased the use of concrete and decreased the use of steel because it gave them I think it gave them enough for a couple of aircraft carriers, you know, which they sorely needed. So, and yet there's been a multi-year innovation that was just uh, winding up, I believe, in 2001, where they did. Add steel rebar and reinforced the building, oh, yeah. particularly particularly on the side of the building where American Airlines Flight seventy seven hit. So, right. uh, but still, it, it hit that E ring and it went at least what to the the, the uh, almost D to the D almost to the to the courtyard. It uh, the 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 cockpit with the dead terrorists and it was found right in the A and E drive, right near the uh, right near the courtyard. So it made it all the way almost through the building like a knife through butter, essentially. Right yeah. under our window. Right. Yeah. Went went in right under where Tony was, and uh, you know the the reason that the army is the focus and then the navy is because that's where it hit. You know, it it hit the army. It did. You know, the Marine Corps got a little bit of it, and the navy. Uh, you know, their uh, command center was under there. You know, was in there, but it was the army. It really got hit. That's why you have so many uh, army officers you know, that were affected. Well, Tony, let's go back to you and then to Marilyn. So the plane literally crashes right under your office, right under your floor. What did you do next to escape? I didn't. Um, I was thrown into a column. I was injured. Next thing I know, I'm laying on the floor and there's a wall of uh, black smoke rolling over me. Uh, it starts turning red. It starts flowing like a river toward the windows that are right next to my office area, which were the very windows that uh, Marilyn were, was leading her team to and eventually rescued people through. Uh, so the aircraft went right under our office when it blew up. I rolled over on my stomach once I could start hearing, went through the old 4-H concept, head, heart, health, and hands. I could hear, I could see, my body worked, and all my training, even before military, at home with mom, dad, grandma, you look after other people. When I could hear other people calling for help, I knew I had to do something, and started that day. Myself and Lieutenant Korea got on our stomachs, low crawled beneath the smoke, and started working away, clearing, and sending people behind us back toward the doors. Um, I went in and out of the building five times that day. The last time I was in, I attached myself to the FBI and to the fire uh, that allowed me to stay in. I stayed there for four hours after that. So. We'll come back to your uh, rescue efforts in just a few minutes. Marilyn, um, the plane was awfully close to where you were in that in that conference and and I think it's okay that we can be blunt at this point in time, 20 years later, but sadly, some of your colleagues were, were killed immediately, and then others like you were able to uh, 
manage to to get together and, and get out. We're, you know, you could pick up the story from there, please. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, to give some perspective of the Pentagon, I was on the second floor of the E ring which is the most exterior ring that the senior officers, our general officers, their offices would be. So being on the E-ring, I was on the inner E-ring in a conference room that we normally have uh, every week with my chief of staff, Colonel Phil McNair. Um, We had no idea what was going on in in New York because our meeting commenced at nine o'clock. So as Colonel McNair uh, called on the Congressional Affairs Officer, myself, to speak immediately. The lights went off. It became immediately dark. You didn't hear anything. When I talked to another officer who sat across from me, he said, Marilyn, you couldn't see the fireball over the top of your head that I know had to have singed the top of my hair. But it knocked me to the opposite side of the room because of the blast. So I'm on the E-ring in this conference room, dark, filled with smoke, hot. And I knew that there was a door on the E-ring exterior. I went to that door. But when I went to that door, it would not open. Um, I touched it and it was very hot. So I knew there was a second door that I could exit. As I crawled across the room, because I was on the left side and I was blown to the right side, I crawled back to the left side of the room. Someone had a hold of my pants. And I said, who are you? Who are you? And she told me who she was, Lois Stevens. And I told her, hold on, where I go, you go. Do not let me go. We're going to get out of here. So no longer was it about getting Marilyn out, but I had someone else who was a civilian who I was charged with getting out of that building. We crawled. I can't tell you how long. It seemed like forever. And it was a Dilbert form is the way I'd like to explain it. As we crawled through desks and chairs and cubicles had been overturned. As we crawled out of the room, if we crawled to the right, I can promise you we wouldn't be here today. Because that is what you see when you see on the television. The whole building fell apart. I crawled to the left. And I continued to crawl until I knew that was a window further down the hallway. All the way from the E-ring to the C-ring is where we crawled. At one point, Lois stopped to say she couldn't go any further because her nylons were melting on her legs. And I told her we have to go. She said, no, Colonel, you go ahead. I'll just, no, I know I'll never leave anyone. So I told her to get on my back and we commenced to crawl again. But as we stopped, I didn't know that there were people behind her who was I was responsible for at that time. And so we got to this window eventually on a and Drive at the C-Ring, and the window wouldn't open. Because in the Pentagon, the window's a bomb, a bomb a blast. Um, and, and that's for a reason, not for a plane flying through, but for other reasons. Um, so it was a young soldier standing there. And I saw a printer. I told him, throw the printer into the window. And he did so, but it fell right back onto my thighs, onto my lap. And we continued to try to throw that printer in. And the window didn't budge. So Colonel McNair, myself, and um, his name is Specialist Petrovich at the time, we continued to beat the frame. And the frame eventually popped open. And the smoke just bellowed out of that room, out of, out of the, the window. And we could see the folks down on A&E Drive, and they were saying, jump, we got you, jump. And um, that's where I'll pause now if there are any questions from that. You jumped from the second floor window into the arms of someone else there, is that right? You And he also caught many other people? Is that my Absolutely. understanding from Lincoln's book? Absolutely. Um, there was one lady who was holding my arm saying, no, I can't go, I can't. I'm like, yeah, you have to. So I peeled her fingers off of me. She fell. And unfortunately, when she fell, she injured him because he fell because she fell out well in her arms and legs. She broke her leg and he was injured in that catch of her. There was another lady, Lois. She was lowered out and he caught her. So he caught, I know, three or four people coming out of that window. Was that big John, Tony? That was absolutely... Uh, Powell. Commander, Powell. Powell. Commander Powell. Commander Powell. Uh, That's right. 
I was down at the ring at that time as I was watching uh, Colonel Wills getting people out the window. I don't even know how she was breathing with that smoke coming out of there like that. She looked like she was literally on fire. And Colonel Powell was just taking them. And then later on, he got the name Big John because he literally put himself between a falling building and us as rescuers as we were trying to pull people out of rubble. Yeah. yeah. What a great person. Yeah. He, he, he and, was the right place at the right time on that day. They should, yeah. they should have they should have an exhibit down at the UDT Seal Museum in Fort Pierce on him because he's a legend. Yeah. He walked with a legend that day for that for his actions that day. He never blinked. He saw the smoke no. he saw us and said, I catch him. Just get him out of there. And he did just that. He caught them. Yeah. And, and, and Ben, um, Marilyn's story wasn't quite over. Uh, your colleague, uh, Ed Lucci, was intimately involved in sort of the next phase, if I may say so, of, of her survival. Can you pick up that there? Because I don't think Marilyn remembers it. I think she was unconscious pretty much uh, from smoke inhalation. If you could finish the rest of that, and then I want to ask you about what you did as well. Sure. So it's funny, Ed Lucci, uh, who still works at Walter Reed, I, I just spoke to him uh, a few days ago. He's in Italy right now. I hope he's been able to log in and watch this. But uh, uh, Ed basically took Marilyn Wills when he, when he found her and put her in his car and started to drive her to the hospital because he knew she was going into acute respiratory distress and she needed an airway. And I believe what happened next was he saw a, an ambulance going by and he, he knew that she was fading and he pulled over his car, stopped, waved down the paramedics because he knew they had airway equipment in there, um, pulled Marilyn out onto the sidewalk and intubated her, uh, put a breathing tube in to control her airway right there on the sidewalk. And then uh, they put her into the, the ambulance and then took whisked her away to the hospital. So, and I, I, Marilyn, I understand that you've never even met Ed Lucci yet. I have not. Well, uh, I'll introduce you to him. He's a great guy. And Please. we have that, Bill, we have that on tape. That's one of the, only a, one of two taped interviews we have. And Ben and I interviewed him in a bar in Georgetown, D.C. And uh, he talks all about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to meet Ed. <laughs> because that part of the story, I, I didn't know. Yeah. And it's in Lincoln's book. And Ben, yeah, I read you, you, you sort of took charge in a sense of what was going on on the lawn. Many of us have seen the pictures of uh, 22,000, perhaps 25,000 of people working the Pentagon exiting. It was a mass exodus. I want to ask you two questions. At one point, there was sort of a false alarm of another plane coming in that led to uh, a panic, I believe it's fair to say, on the lawn. And then please explain that. And then once that sort of dissipated, the order uh, that you helped impose on the triage to help people who were burned and suffering smoke yeah. inhalation and, and worse injuries. So the first thing that I saw when we when our bus, our police escorted bus got to the Pentagon, our bus driver was understandably a little bit anxious. And uh, so he drove up over some barriers and right onto the the grounds of the Pentagon and drove all the way up to the wall that was on fire and dropped us off right next to the fire. And it was so hot there that we actually had to walk away from the wall of the Pentagon because the heat was so intense. And I saw something that was very unusual. I, I saw a fire truck that was on fire. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. Did the fire company get too close to the building and all of a sudden the fire trucks on fire. Well, it actually happened to be a fire truck that it was protocol when the president was landing at the Pentagon, which George Bush was supposed to be landing at the helicopter pad at the Pentagon later that day to then drive over to, to the white house. It was protocol to place a fire truck on the helicopter pad uh, just as a safety security measure. And when the, Airplane came in, and this is well described in the book. Link has interviewed Alan Wallace. Alan Wallace was the fireman who pulled the, the truck out. He saw the plane coming into the Pentagon and started to run away from the wall of the Pentagon and got caught by this massive fireball 
that burned the buckles of his suspenders into his back. So that's what I saw when we got there. And not soon, not too much longer after that, there were two instances where someone got on a bullhorn and said, there's a second plane inbound, evacuate the premises. And people started screaming. And, you know, I looked around and I saw this guy with a, a blue jacket that had the yellow letters FBI on the back, and he was running to an underpass. And I decided to follow him. And I was looking up in the sky. I remember looking up over Arlington Cemetery and that area and looking for a plane uh, coming toward me. And I was trying to figure out, okay, if it comes from this direction, I'll just jump in this ditch to avoid a fireball. That happened twice. Then when we finally got back and started to organize, um, there were people everywhere. That's one of the themes of the day is that people came out of the woodwork to help. There were tons of people around and lots of medical personnel. We divided uh, our, our patients and well, basically we divided our teams into four groups. And I, I, I looked around and, and saw a bunch of people that I knew but I asked, first of all, who has advanced trauma life support training, ATLS training? Few people raised their hands. They were all surgeons. I pulled them in. I said, okay, you're in charge. I put people together. So I would grab one person, grab another person, put them together. I said, you're a team. I want you to be in charge of this section. So we had the delayed, the immediate, the minimal, and the expectant. The expectant are those who are expected to die. And you would put those patients on comfort measures. So I put the pathologist and the pharmacist who had a case of morphine in charge of the um, expectant category. I put the um, orthopedic surgeon in charge of the delayed category. The, the delayed, they need treatment. They have lacerations or broken bones, but they're the walking wounded. They can uh, carry litters and be litter bearers. Um, the immediate are those who need immediate life-saving treatment, like Maryland, who need an airway. They need airway control to be able to ventilate, um, uh, or those who have uncontrollable hemorrhage. And then the, um, the uh, uh, minimal are those who have minimal injuries and also could be uh, treated at some point down the line. So it was, it was kind of a, a very chaotic situation. Tony's on the inside. I'm on the outside. Tony's trying to get patients to us on the outside. M the reality of it is, is that most of the patients that we could help had already been evacuated uh, mm -hmm. to nearby hospitals. And it was a recovery operation at that point. But what was going on inside the Pentagon, those are the stories that need to be told. Tony Rose's story, Marilyn Wills's story, Christopher Brayman's story. Those are the, st the stories that no one's heard before. And just one more fact check with you, Ben. Um in the end of the day, not that many people went to Walter Reed or other hospitals for injuries. That's that's correct. That's correct. So um, most of the people that were killed were killed instantly. Um, remember, there was a renovation going on at the Pentagon, and there were normally supposed to be around 4,500 people in that wedge of the Pentagon, but only 800 people were in there because of the renovations that were occurring. So... Tony, I think I lost count reading Lincoln's book. Was it five times or more? I think you may have actually said so earlier. Uh, going back into the building and you kept going back, even as the fire got worse, even as firefighters and other uniformed people tried to literally stand in your way and said, you can't go there. It's too dangerous. Can you explain what you did and why? They were my friends, co-workers, family, really, in that building. And uh, I marched to the drum of a higher drum, uh, general that's on this earth. And as long as I'm living, I'm supposed to be helping other people. And the uh, good Lord says he knows me so well, he knows the number of hairs on my head. I didn't have any more then than I do now, so... We might as well get up and go to work. Uh, I was hurt, but I didn't know that I was hurt. I didn't know that till 12 o'clock at night. Uh, I dislocated my shoulder. 
I had shrapnel in my uh, chest. I had busted my left knee. And all of us were getting burned from the smoke and from wires melting, ceiling melting, things falling. But there was this drive that you knew people were certain places and you had to help them. I, uh, uh, a mentor and friend, Larry Strickland, was not far from where Colonel Wells was. A great respect for that man. I knew I had to get to him uh, as best as I could. Other people needed help. And a couple of times, uh, security people tried to stop us, but it was, you know, a very simple statement. Get the hell out of my way. My friends are in there. We're going to go get them. And we did. There's people that we brought out that would have died. In fact, two people were being led out by Colonel Wells, uh, Regina Grant and uh, Tracy Webb. They in the smoke uh, had got disjointed from that train. Colonel, I have no idea, ma'am, how you made it down that Dilbert hallway. No idea because we were having a hard time getting in. But they had got dislocated and had gone into another corridor and had come up against one of the fire doors that was closed. They did not know it was a door. They thought it was a wall. And they were at that point ready to give up and die at admittal so uh, until we heard something in the smoke, got that fire door open and got them out so that they could get to the outside. And it was just like that all day long, you would hear something where someone would say, we know so-and-so was in this area. And we would go as far as we could go to find them. We couldn't stop. You had to keep going. And, it's, and, and Bill, if I can add on Tony, Please. what Tony said, even though, you know, I, I gave a little abbreviated version at that windowsill, when I was given an order by my colonel to get out of the window, that was the order I did not want to obey for mm -hmm. that very reason. I knew there were others in there. I knew Regina was still in that building. I knew she was a part of our train, but she wasn't there when we got to the window. So I shared with Colonel McNair, she's got to not be far. We got to go back. And we both tried and we knew we couldn't breathe. We couldn't see. We knew it was suicidal, but we didn't want to leave because we knew people were there. And this is yeah. something we never leave anyone behind. Where we found her from where she got dislocated was a 40 feet away in an opposite direction. And had the colonel left the window, she would not be sitting here right now. Because when that smoke started coming in then, it was boiling hot, torching everything it touched. Tony, uh, so few people actually saw in real time, the plane hit the building. And unlike the situation in New York, there was no video of that for the longest time. Later on, years oh. later, there was one uh, security camera, surveillance camera, I think it was on a lamp post or a light pole outside the Pentagon, which right. later was released, put some conspiracy theories to rest with that. It was shown in the Massawi trial in huh. 2006, the only trial we've had in America for 9-11. But Tony, what did you see that day with regard to a plane when you got to the courtyard? Because I think it's important that people know. I was one of the first five people that were there. And Lincoln, I have to tell you, you've, you've done your research so well. You could have been right there with us the way you described it. When that plane came under the Colonel's office area, blew up under my office area, exited the C ring and blew up against the B ring wall, there was just a huge hole that smoke was just coming out of. When we got to that B ring wall, there was part of a fuselage and part of a wheel. And I've been in the Army 31 years, from infantry, infantry to engineers. I've never seen a missile with a wheel on it. We knew it was a plane and the carnage was just terrible. Body parts building plane all together. We absolutely knew at that point it was an aircraft. And this is going to be a little disturbing, but I'm, I'm going to bring it up because we're being candid 20 years on. When you mentioned body parts, Tony, did you at one point come across what appeared to be a child's body part? Would you mind explaining that if you don't mind? The um, 
when the building collapsed that Colonel talked about, uh, when it collapsed, there was five floors of latrines, waterworks, everything collapsed. There was all kinds of uh, filth and water all over the place. And in that ring between B and C, it's, it's like a canal, a cement canal. And of course, it's got drains in there. Fire water was coming in from the departments from the outside, from where Ben was at. It was getting high, and uh, Colonel um, and Commander Powell and I noticed that some of the things floating by were body parts. Uh, we tried to pick some things up and put them on bricks or whatever we could out of the water, and at one point, uh, I picked up a child's hand and uh, I had no place to put it except in my pocket. So it stayed there for a little while till like somebody with a body collection bag could get it from me. But at that minute, I, I just got so mad that someone would attack my family, my country, my home. I mean, I would have ripped off their heads and spit down the hole if I, if I could have got close to them. It was just a cold rage that here's an innocent child, somebody's kid, you know, born forever. Yeah, it, it was bad. I'm going to read this just summary sentence, which no one has said. Uh, the Pentagon attack killed 184 people, 53 passengers, which included some children, and six crew members on board American Airlines Flight 77, and also 125 military and civilian personnel inside the building. Before I come back to you, Lincoln, uh, I want to ask Marilyn just to weigh in on one of those people was someone called Max Belke, and I know you knew him, Marilyn, um, but let our audience know who he was and, in a sense, had already been part of American history. Before yes. Max Belke was just an awesome, an awesome person. But so you know who Max Belke was. He was the last, the last person to come out of Vietnam who was in the meeting with me initially, but he was called over to the E-ring to General Maud's office. He sat in that area right where the plane entered that building. So Max Belke and General Maud and General Maud staff who were over there, including one of my dear friends, Marion Server. I work with Marion every day. And we would talk about her relationship with her daughter the same way I would want the relationships with my daughters. And it was very difficult. But Max was just an awesome person to know and to know that he was the last one to come out of Vietnam and to have lived his life and to end it in this way. And, and all of those people, all 184, of course, are memorialized now at the Pentagon with individual benches and uh, that acknowledgement. Um, did either of you, Marilyn or Tony or Ben, learn something uh, new uh, in Lincoln's book that you hadn't known before in terms of, for example, Marilyn's story, not even knowing the name of the doctor after she jumped from the window and was caught, who later saved her life on the road. Oh, absolutely. That, that part of the book really opened the pages for me to let me know the rest of the story. You know, I could share what happened in the building, but I would tell you, um, um, Lincoln, you told me so many other things in that book that I did not know. Um, that was one. And then secondly, just how bad I really was. I was really ready to go back, but then an immediate injury that I just learned from Ben, I knew I couldn't. You so, been dead. Yeah, just, just so, many, so many things to open up for me. And, and Lincoln, because we've lost our, our connection, it appears with, with Christopher uh, Brayman. Um, could you share with me how he, like Tony, kept going back into the building and what he encountered um, uh, from what you, what you recount in your book um, on that day over and over again, well into the night? He was like a machine. 
And uh, they had to literally shut him down at the end, or he would have just kept going until he dropped dead, essentially. Um, he was finding, I mean, he ended up, when the D.C. fire got there, there was a standoff between Chris and uh, <laughs> Major Theodore Henderson, Anderson, yeah. um, outside, and they were faced off with the D.C. fire, and they uh, DC fire said, you can't go in. And they said, we've got people in there. And I know they're right inside the building. And we're going in there. And uh, they broke through the ranks of the DC fire and got inside and the firemen pulled them back out of there. They pulled, they had to literally fo- pull them back out of there. And later on they went in and they found a whole stack of people in one area that were all dead. Yeah. They were just inside the uh, wall. If they'd allowed them to go in, they could have saved them. But that's not to cast aspersions on D.C. fire because it was a classic standoff when neither side was right or wrong. They were doing their job, and uh, the military was like, we're not going to leave our people behind. And that's a classic unreconcilable situation, you know. And, uh, and I, didn't, I didn't ever want to portray the D.C. fire as being a bad guy. You know, it was just the situation. They were just doing their job trying to save lives. But they just didn't understand the military mindset, at least the ones that had never been in the military, you know. So uh, Chris, basically, they had to come to him and tell him that he had to leave. And as he was leaving, he passed a Red Cross area and he saw a little girl with her mother. There was no father there. And that little girl stayed on his mind. He got home and he showered and he told his wife, I got to go back. And one of the most powerful scenes, along with the scene of Tony finding the child's hand, I would say, is when he r- raced back to the Pentagon in his car and it finally came down. And he just he, co- he just basically lost and rolled to the side of the road. He was exhausted. I mean, he'd been going in and out of there with no sleep. His whole uniform was covered in human tissue and blood. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I... I'm just, I'm humbled by him and by Tony, by Marilyn, all my mother, all these people that were there, you know, it's true heroism because a hero doesn't think, how am I going to get out of here? He thinks, how am I going to get all these people out of here? That's Mm -hmm. the only difference. And you don't ever know whether or not that you're going to react that way until it happens. And it happens just like that. And that's when you find out something about yourself. Absolutely. A lot of people who survived the Pentagon, including people on this panel and people in your book, um, have nightmares. Uh, Some have PTSD. Um, And I wanted to see if I could ask you, Marilyn and Tony, um, if you've had something that's sometimes called survivor's guilt over the years. Marilyn? Yeah, you know, um, that was the initial thought after I was... um, brought back to conscious and being in Walter Reed. Why me? There were approximately 16 of us in that room. Why didn't we all make it out? Why Marilyn? Why was I given that charge? The gentleman sitting in my chair with Marion is no longer with us. Why wasn't I sitting in that chair? Why him? So I had to deal with that for a very long time. That survivor's guilt is is difficult. Um, I was seen by a psychiatrist for several years um, because I wasn't the same. Um, I was angry. Um, I would get upset with my daughters and my husband for no reason, so I thought. And that reason was not dealing with what had happened to me. PTSD, yes. Do I have nightmares? Yes. Can I still smell what I smelt when I went back into that building 14 days later? Yes. Can I, do I see ghosts walking down the hallway when I was in that building? Yes. All of those things happened to Marilyn. When I went back as a colonel in the Pentagon and had to sit on the earring when they opened the airways to have planes fly over that building, did I do that? Yes. Was it difficult? Absolutely. Mm. But it was something about being in the military that I will say not only prepared me, 
that showed me that I could, that I could continue to serve, that I could continue on with my life. But those things are even still there today. I still suffer with some of this PTSD. Loud noises, I'm startled. It, it just frightens me. Yep. Um, so, Tony, go right ahead. Yeah, P P P PTSD is really there. Uh, when I retired from the military, I went back and got my degree in psychology and became a licensed therapist. Uh, sort of selfishly because I knew I needed help myself, but also to be able to help other people and help first responders and military. But really for myself, immediately after 9-11, we didn't have counselors. The, the military put the cone of silence on. We wanted the rest of the world to focus on New York, Shanksville, uh, on everything else but us. We didn't want them to see America's arm of might being hurt. Uh, we went back the next day, 10,000 of us hurt, looking for friends, recovering bodies, securing documents, helping each other. You would turn around to ask someone for help and realize that person had just died less than 24 hours earlier or was not yet found. Um, sometimes I hate 4th of July. I can I can smell a burnt hamburger and immediately I'm right in the middle of that smoke again. Uh, startle effect. <laughs> My wife and I have been married 46 years. She does not walk into a room that I'm in without saying knock knock because I will respond uh, out of fear and it's not something you control. We record those acts in all five of our senses. Some people remember the blue sky, some remember a taste of coffee, some remember a handshake or a smile. We won't forget it. It will just go away slowly in various ways, but it's with us for the rest of our lives. And I can see and smell and think of every one of those people just as clear today as I did then, just as clear as I can see that little hand in sleep. It's there and people should not forget because it's not if it happens again, it's when it happens again. That's simply because of the people who are classified as our enemies that do not like our country. Their mode of operandi is you can't leave a job unfinished. And our friends still at the Pentagon are watchful, wondering when their time will come. That's the way it is, folks. And and Ben, of course, besides these psychological scars, post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, many people had horrible physical injuries, life-changing physical injuries, burns. Um, oh yeah. How how do those people fare two decades later? Uh, uh, they're, yeah, they're they're permanently damaged. Um, you know the integument which is the skin. That's the largest organ in the body by far. Um, the, the surface area of anyone's skin is a, is a large, uh, a large uh, component of the body. And to have facial burns uh, where your eyes are burned shut, uh, to have the creases of your mouths burned, your ears burned off. Um, these patients have chronic pain, have to go through multiple, multiple operations to skin graft, uh, or to put uh, different types of skin substitutes on their bodies. They're in just terrible, terrible pain. It's so painful um, to have burn injuries. A anyone that's ever burned themselves, even a minor burn, yeah. uh, knows that to be true. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's difficult. And, you know, one note on PTSD, it's interesting, Marilyn, you say that um, uh, olfactory hallucinations are the, that's the sense of smell. Yes. are the earliest signs of PTSD. And I remember coming back from a combat deployment to Iraq where I um, was at a, a, a lecture and I was seeing pictures of the battlefield, on the battlefield. And I was it was a breakfast meeting and I, I started to notice, I, was, <laughs> I, I looked at the guys around me, I said, do you smell that? And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. And, and 
and I found out later that it was, you know, olfactory hallucinations. I was in the battlefield. Mm-hmm. And that went away. I don't have that happen to me anymore. It was very fresh after coming to the battlefield. I'd like to add one other thing to what you're saying, Ben, and you're so right. There's so many of the injuries that we don't see, too, besides just the PTSD. In 72, with the 82nd Airborne, I broke my neck and back and had uh, uh, paralysis from the chin down for quite a while until they wired me back together. So I love doctors, okay? You're my heroes. <laughs> but on 9-11, when I was blown back into that wall, I hit the same C7 T1 neck area and re-injured it and the shoulder that, you know, 25 years before was finally healing except for the arthritis. And now every month I have to get a, a shot in the, in the stanula ganglion to help relieve the pain to be able to stay mobile because yes. there's injuries inside that happen and re-injuries. Right. It's interesting because uh, not only did everything happen that you all have talked about going back the next day, 14 days later, um, but the smell was still there. It was still an awful um, attack site and crime scene. Um, I I remember that the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld felt it was important to actually have a press conference on 9-11 that evening to show that America's military was still going. And then, of course, remarkably, compared to New York, for instance, where it took, you know, 10 years to rebuild anything, uh, within one year, the Pentagon was rebuilt. You bet and you. I believe you were you were there for that ceremony. Um, what was that like to be there just one year later to see the physical reconstruction uh, occur? Marilyn? Um, you know, it, it, it was mind blowing. We knew it was something that had to be done to show the might of the military that we're still here. The better news is all of the construction teams, engineers, um, workers, people just came out to feed those uh, construction workers to help build that building. It was worth the wait of a year, but it was also worth showing the might of the military that no, that bruised us, but it didn't stop us. Look at us now, we're back in our building in less than a year, Um, which speaks of the hearts of the American people. Um, I'll just share this quick story. My parents are in Louisiana. When this happened, all flights were grounded. They couldn't travel. They got in their car, and they drove 26 hours from Louisiana to Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. never paid for gas, never paid for food because they were telling people my daughter was in the Pentagon. People were helping them out. That shows the resolve of the American people. That's what I know about America. And that's what made it so great to have that building redone in one year. And we'll back in. It was a warm feeling of national unity at that time. It brought us together as a country, ironically. And it gave us hope. Uh, you know, we can, we can live maybe 30 days without food, seven days, depending on conditions, without good water. But like we all saw on 9-11, some people died because they didn't have hope. You can't live five minutes without hope. And it let our nation know that we were strong and we were a family and we were going to keep going on. That's one thing that I, uh, I, I learned about Marilyn is she's one that shines in that regard because she let those, those ladies that she were in that darkness with her, it was her, it was her keeping her head yes. and giving them hope that they would get out of there. Absolutely. That, that was so uh, admirable and so incredible. You know, but uh, there were there were a lot of people like like that, you know, and, and that's that's why that chapter is called A Voice in the Darkness, because that's all they had to go on. That's it. You know, that's very true. And, and I knew the smoke was getting me, but I had to let them hear my voice that you're going to be OK. We're going to get out of here. Even though in my mind, I don't know if I was saying what I was thinking, but they would never know that. <laughs> We were going to that's, get out. That's God. That was God moving through you. 
Absolutely. Uh, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Through you. Like, like it worked through Tony, like it worked through Craig That's Powell, right. like it worked through uh, Christopher Brain. That's when I right. said in his book, I, the inscription I put on there was that God could not always be with his children, mm-hmm. so he put heroes on the earth to look after them. That's right. Amen. And, and, and Lincoln, our, our other uh, panels are too modest, but I think you allude to this in the book. Uh, a lot of people receive medals uh, for valor, Purple Hearts, that kind of thing. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, I... <laughs> A medal is an exterior thing. It's a, it's a, what do you want to call it? It's just a manifestation of what's in their hearts. That's what's most important is what was in their hearts. You know, their hearts were pure. They, they were willing to risk their own lives to get other people to save them. And like I said, you don't know if that's in you until it happens. Until something like that happens suddenly and you have to react and the people that reacted that way know that they were pure of heart. And the ones that didn't, well, you know, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not passing any judgment, but you don't know what you're going to do. I, I don't know what I would do. I would like to believe that I would react like Marilyn or Tony, but I don't know that until it happens. And that's just the truth of it. I don't think anyone does until that time yeah. comes. I think that's a question that every warrior has got on their mind. What will happen when that first round is fired? Right. Because it's real and because your life, you're staring death in the face. Mm-hmm. And that's that's totally different than anything else you're used to. You know? I just wanted to invite each of you to have sort of a, a closing thought as we're winding this down now. Our time is running out, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, there's so much we could continue to talk about. 20 years, 9-11 easily one of the most consequential days in American history, um, immediately ending 3,000 lives, uh, deeply affecting thousands and thousands of more directly, affecting the whole country, leading to at least two wars and, and other conflicts that we've been involved in, um, and so, many un, so much unfinished business, including uh, justice for 9-11 families and victims oh. and and all of us, uh, ironically, as we speak tonight, uh, again, after many years of delays, uh, proceedings in a military tribunal in Guantanamo Bay, or, or re- rebooting, if you will, um, five people accused of having a direct role in, in these horrific attacks. Um, what, what is the takeaway that you want our audience to, to think about um, as we get to Saturday, this 20th anniversary um, along the lines that I just sort of laid out. Um, Tony, why don't we start with you? I've never been back to the Pentagon. I can't bring myself to do that yet. I've been by there going to Andrews Air Force Base on my way to Guantanamo. I'm one of the witnesses because I saw the nose cone. I can say it was an airplane. I looked at those five individuals I was supposed to be there this year, illness and COVID's taking care of that. But I hope the day comes when those individuals see uh, the justice they deserve. I, I hope America realizes that none of us stand alone. We all have to look after each other. We are really a family and we need to care not walk by when someone needs a hand or is hurt, but stop and take a moment and be their angel, be their hero, because there's going to come a time when all of us is going to need one. Yes, I know people are going to be there for me, just like Marilyn and Craig Powell and Chris, because they're family. I hope people don't forget that. Marilyn? You know, um, my hope and desire is that we make sure our young children, our young Mm -hmm. adults know what happened on September 11th. They weren't born. Um, All the naysayers who say it wasn't a play, Mm -hmm. we were there. We Mm -hmm. saw it. Um, Additionally, I got to talk about the book. Get the book, read the book, it's in there. 
um, and just know that there is hope for America. Yeah. Right now, we are a country crying. We need to be with each other. We need to join this country back together the way it was before. And just, just love and put hope out there. Um, but yeah. pray and consider those families who lost their loved ones, those mothers and daughters and children and all of the loved ones who were lost. And then pray for us as well as every year we discuss this. We know our lives are a history book, but consider praying for us as well because we have to carry this torch for the rest of our lives. And I got one, I got one PS for you, Ben and Lincoln. God bless you both for, for doing this. Phil and your team for bringing it together. This is not fake news. This is real people talking about real events that people need to remember and hear the truth. And God bless you for telling it. Thank you. Ben, a final thought from you, please. Ben, yeah. make sure you mention Ed. Thank you, Ed. I want to yeah. talk to Ed. <laughs> okay. So thanks, Phil. You know, I... Uh, we've had a couple of book signing events where I stood up in front of crowds of people and I don't typically get emotional, but as I started to speak to some of these people and tell the story, I found myself becoming very emotional and I couldn't figure out why. And, and I guess it's just natural, but to look back and to have to trace everything back to that one day and the, the, the power of that day and the impact of that single day on the last 20 years. I've taken care of soldiers on the battlefield that were dead, had their legs blown off. I've operated on soldiers that were wounded, sent them home with no extremities or with terrible injuries. Um, and all of it traces back to that day and how we responded on that day. And I'm proud of the way America responded to that, uh, those attacks on that day. I'll say that this is American history, and that's the reason that Link and I brought this book uh, to the present. You know, when we originally published it, or when we when Link finished it back in 2004, the, nobody was interested in publishing another book on 9-11. Nobody had an appetite to read an, about 9-11 anymore. And so we shelved the project, and it came time for us to resurrect it and for the 20th anniversary. And these stories, we need these inspirational stories. We need these stories, particularly now, the way our country is, uh, the condition that our country's in right now. And I'm really proud of my brother for writing this amazing book. It's got fantastic reviews. I had a friend come up to me the other day and say, he gave a copy to his father and his father said, that's the best book I've read in 10 years. So I'm proud of you, brother. Um, and Amen. thank you, Phil, for, for putting this on. And Lincoln, let's give you the last, last word. Uh, American Phoenix, uh, the Pentagon rising from the ashes. America, in a sense, rising from the ashes. What, what's the, uh, there it is. Everyone's going to hold it up. I can hold it up, too. It's published by, <laughs> published by uh, Girl Friday Books, a Seattle-based publisher. Um, what should oh, people have be thinking one, about that? I have one question for our enemies, any enemy of this country, and that is, where's the Napoleonic Empire? It's gone. Where's the British Empire? Gone. Where are the Nazis? Gone. Where are the Soviet Russians? Gone. This country has stood for 245 years, right? About 245 years. And what is the strength of this country? It's the fact that this country is protected by God, and it's the American people and the Constitution of the United States of America. And if you think you're going to beat that, you're wrong. Amen. This country will not be defeated. It will never be defeated. And it will lift all other countries in this world up to its level, to where everyone loves everyone else. And we have a very beautiful world one day. And that's coming. You can bank on it. Amen. One Lincoln, thing to buy you. from my desk that day. <laughs> Little Uncle Sam <laughs> should have just burnt up. That's right. But you're right. Lots of, lots of stories like that, like the flag and in, uh, in Nolan's or uh, Murphy, Murphy's yeah. office, the Marine. Right. 
that was standing up that Panaleo went and recovered with Chris Brayman. Yeah. It was just standing up there on that precipice. The whole building had been blown away from it, but that flag was still standing there. That was, like, that was a very good sign. It was a divine sign. Amen. Well, everyone, we're out of time. I want to thank our, our panelists, the author, Lincoln Starnes, his brother, Ben Starnes, Marilyn Wills, and, and Tony Rose. And for a while, we had Chris Brayman, all who were in the Pentagon on 9 11. I want to thank Tom Nastic from the National Archives, as well as Karen McNally Upson and Katie Myers for helping to organize this panel. If you missed any part of this program or want to watch it again, I believe it will be up on the National Archives YouTube page. Thanks to our audience for tuning in and keep on clicking. If you want to watch it again on the internet, it's up there forever. Uh, that's all. I'm Phil Hirschkorn. Thank you all for watching and good night.